So let's start with the uh, let's start with Aleppo. I want to start with Aleppo because I think it's uh, obviously one of the major uh, things happening today. One of the major breaking news. So Aleppo and, and the question that I want to ask honestly is, has Aleppo fallen or has Aleppo been liberated? And the reason I'm asking that is because Syria presents a unique problem for a progressive foreign policy, uh, a progressive worldview, uh, particularly in foreign policy. And we've discussed it at length on the show. And this microphone is like so in a bad position, but we'll make it work. Um, we've discussed it at length at the sh on the show um, because of some of the subtexts that evolves from the conversation on Syria. So let's start with just the headline. Uh, let's start with the news first, rather, on Aleppo. So um, Aleppo, I believe, um, is t has been taken by the um, Assad forces, uh, backed by Russia. Uh, there has been, as of the start of this show, a ceasefire uh, that was called. But all throughout the day, Russian and, uh, well, uh, Syrian forces with air support from from Russia, but uh, Syrian forces have been inching inch by inch reclaiming the city. Um, the Syrian army earlier today said that they had taken 98 percent of the territory. Uh, but with the ceasefire, um, Russia has informed the U.N. that they are going to send in buses to take out the remaining fighters and to lead the civilians there because, of course, the city is now back underneath the control of government forces. So there's really no need for the civilians to leave, according to what Russia has told the United Nations. Um, so there are about 80,000 civilians who are now still within uh, a few square miles e in east uh, of East Aleppo um, that uh, remain underneath opposition control. That is the fluid situation now with the ceasefire and the transition from those forces. Now, And, and honestly, if you're watching this after 12, 13 uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the story is probably totally different. Uh, so um, we'll give you the information, obviously, but this is one of the most time-sensitive issues. I believe at 5 a.m. local time uh, in Aleppo, that's when the buses are going to come in and escort out the remaining fighters. We'll see how that goes. Uh, a spokesman for the U.N. High Commission of Human Rights uh, said that he had been informed that 82 civilian, including women and children, were shot in their homes or in the streets on Monday. Uh, here's a quote. He said, we have collectively failed the people of Syria. Um, I'm sorry, and this is from the U.N. Secretary General Ban Kin Ki-moon. Uh, a U.S. ambassador to U.N., Samantha Power, excoriated Syria, Russia, and, and Iran for the bloodshed in Aleppo. Um, and this was an interesting exchange. I wish I had the video for this, but I don't have it for you now. Uh, and it, but this was an interesting exchange. She said, are you truly incapable of shame? Is there nothing you will not lie about? Uh, your barrel bombs and airstrikes, it is your news, she said. Um, to that, Russia pretty much replied, um, you're no, to America, you're no Mother Teresa. Uh, it was okay. It's an interesting rebuttal. Uh, so activists said uh, anyone with links to the rebels who seized control of the enclave, um, they were being hunted down. Um, this is a quote uh, from the Syrian Observatory of Human Rights. They said, every hour, butcheries are carried out. And we've seen the videos online. If you haven't, you sh they're kind of chilling to watch of uh, activists slash uh, on the ground reporters making their uh, final farewells as the government forces were closing in to um, reclaim Aleppo. One, um, okay, that's enough. That's enough of the, uh, the details because, again, by the morning, by the time most of you watch this clip or listen, even listen to the full podcast, uh, some of this would have changed significantly. The conversation that I want to have is the conversation that I've been having with the audience for a while in regards to Syria and a uh, American interventionism in general and the question of a progressive foreign policy. 
And I think Syria is the perfect flashpoint for this type of analysis. Um, in the backdrop of this analysis, I think we also forget, not just my analysis, but the conversation in general, we forget the human loss of life. And we, I think most of us forget it in between the argument of anti-American imperialism and interventionism in Syria versus um, Assad is a bastard who is brutalizing his people and he needs to be taken down. Therefore, we need to be on the side of the rebels. So in between those two arguments um, really exists the, Euro, the real human tragedy of whoever's doing the particular killing at that moment. And even before I go into any analysis, I think that's the most important thing to realize. If you go into the hashtag Aleppo on social media, you're going to see half of people swearing that any negative news against the Assad regime is propaganda propped up by American imperialism. And then on the opposite side, you have people who are swearing that the only atrocities happening in Aleppo are because of the Assad regime, when in fact there is some ownership and a lot of ownership to be laid at the feet of the rebels. And the fact that the, the definition, the breakdown of the rebel groups is so complicated just in Aleppo alone to actually unpack it is... is to, no, not to even unpack it, but to oversimplify it and just say rebels does a disservice to a robust analysis. But forget the analysis. Again, I want to talk about the human life that is forgotten in between the two extremes, competing sides, people who are saying it's all a side and people who say, no, it's uh, it's only the rebels. I don't think a person who's who is facing the barrel of a bullet, the barrel of a gun. Really is concerned about who's pulling the trigger as much as the fact that they're about to get killed or their home is going to be bombed or they're going to be used as a human shield, right? And so there's these competing narratives of who's really the bastard in Syria, particularly Aleppo. And to me, it's like, why reduce complicated situ situations into being good guys versus the bad guys and being cops and robbers, right? Like there is a perfectly good actor and there's a perfectly bad actor when in reality, everybody and their mama got blood on their hands. Everybody. But people have to live in this absolute is kind of existence where it's either black or or white, it's good versus evil. Either it is American imperialism's hand is involved or America is perfectly. And, and the fact that we even analyze this through the lens of American intervention and, 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 and America in general all reduces it down to overly simplified, overly simplified analyses that, one, erase the real tragedy of the human life that was lost, and two, doesn't even scrape, doesn't even scratch the surface of what's really happening in Aleppo and, the, and Syria in general and the background, the underlying factors, right? That's what bothers me the most. And if you're, I mean, I don't know who you are, right? I know you're my audience and I appreciate you. But if you're like me, you don't really care about all of those competing political forces when it's real lives that are people are dying. Now, because my profession is po political analysis and political science, of course, got to move beyond the emotionalism of seeing uh, people die. And I, again, I want to make it clear. I don't care if you're saying that the rebel information is propaganda or the Syrian information is propaganda, really, th at the end of the day, all of it is propaganda. All of it. Because, one, 
And even if we could get the independent journalists in there and the journalists in there, which they can't because it's so dangerous, even if we could have gotten them in there, they still would have been some type of conduit for a form of propaganda. And we would have depended on those journalists to be extremely robust to unpack the propaganda. But we didn't get access with journalists. So everything that we're getting is either being fed to us by the rebels or being fed to us by the Assad regime, both of which is 100 percent propaganda. Doesn't mean both of them are lies. Doesn't mean all of it is lies. It means that they're going to feed us the information that forwards their narrative. That's how both sides play. And what bothers me about this conversation is that we're quick to say, um, particularly, I love us. I love the left. I am a leftist. I'm a damn near, I'm, I'm not damn near, I'm a socialist. I am, I'm over here, anti-imperialism, as much as the world could actually exist outside of empire. That's a big ass caveat. We'll discuss that later. I'm over here on the left. I love the left. But with Syria in particular, we have reduced it down to being about America and American in interventionism and America's empire. And and we we can't. It's like nobody could understand what was going on in Aleppo except through that overly simplified lens. And that American centric lens, everything that happens in the global community is not because of America for America or anything else. Right. It's, it's this it's this inability to see anything except through the lens that America is bad. Which forces people in this particular conversation with uh, with with Syria and particularly Aleppo. Yes, the rebels who remain after the breakdown of the Free yeah, Syrian Army, um, the, the people who remain are a mixture of jihadists, of Al-Qaeda, some ISIS. I mean, there are some, some terrible actors involved in Aleppo. But it's like we've had to weave this, instead of just saying this is a sectarian conflict, this is a, this is a, a, a protest that turn into suppression of oppress uh, of the protests, which turn into a deep civil divide, which turn into a defecting of 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 Syrian uh, generals and Syrian officers defecting and stating that they want to oust Assad, turning into a civil war, being hijacked by Islamists devolving into a civil war and a sectarian conflict. And now the end of that, we've reduced all of those steps down to being about America. <laughs> like, I mean, God bless America, but we are not, we, we, uh, I was going to say we're not that fucking important, but we are. But everything that happens in the global community is not because of America. The people, the students who started the, the quote-unquote revolution in 2011, they were, and, and it, it goes back to that, right? You even have people who say, well, the original impetus for the, for the, for the uh, Arab Spring was because of uh, uh, America, the CIA was funding uh, insurrections across, right? Because, because of, of the, the thing that America loves the most is <laughs> instability, right? <laughs> because, because everything has to be about America, Therefore, America was using the CIA to to overthrow and, and institute regime change. Because, as we all know, the most important thing to America is instability. But I digress. We reduce on the left this down to being about America's footprint in the region. And that is such an overly grossly oversimplified reductionist erasure of all of the flashpoints that happened inside of Syria that have led to this point. Even the oil pipeline article by, uh, by um, Kennedy, um, Robert Kennedy Jr., who I'm a colleague of at Ring of Fire, I love his work, but that even reduces, that grossly reduces the, uh, I said oil pipeline, it's a natural gas pipeline actually, reduces this down to being about America. When in actuality, it's very you, you're stripping, you're stripping all those people who fought for their individual reasons. You're stripping and died for their individual reasons, whether we agree with them or not. We're stripping them of any any agency. We're just saying, nah, bitch, the only way you could be involved in this is if America paid you. 
because it's all about America. It's all about Israel. It's all about oil. And it's all about this pipeline. And I, and I do want to say this. America's not that important that we have to define every single thing that happened in the global community through the lens of America. It's not. But I digress. Now, the flip side of that um, is, is the, 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 the fact that what may have started as a collection of students and professors and then eventually officers who wanted to overthrow the Assad dictatorship, right? Let's, let's be sure. Let's not, uh, which is going to be my third point. Maybe I need to break this clip up. I don't know. But, but the, we, we, we've reduced the other side of the argument rather reduces the reality that what started off as one thing has ended as something completely different, right? They, they started off fighting for more democracy, the overthrow of a dictator and con continuation of a secular society. And it has quite frankly, I mean, it's over now for the most part, but it did de devolve into a sectarian conflict between Islamist extremists and jihadists, right? So there is this, there is this narrative that has been woven that is, um, that is, looks so favorably on the rebels and completely erases the fact that some of the rebels are even more brutal than Assad, right? And we've talked about this so much, but it just blows me away that we can't look at this super complicated cluster F of a conflict without reducing it to being simply a side is good and the rebels are evil or the rebels are good and a side is evil. When in actuality, both of them are bastards. Both groups are bastards. Both of them have, have killed countless, countless civilians. Both of them have committed and because war crimes is such a specific word, um, I can't say that both groups have committed war crimes. I will say it's very likely that both groups have committed war crimes. I'll look it up before the end of the show. I know on the side side, we can't have this conversation without simplifying it and simplifying the world into being simply good versus evil. And whenever you look at something through a overly simplistic, moralistic view, you miss the forest for the trees. I'm not talking about you, the audience. I know the audience who's listening, you guys are really used to these types of conversations. I'm just, I'm talking about mainstream media. I'm talking about analysts, so-called analysts. It's like everybody had to pick a side in this. And again, like, and I saw, I, uh, this is the last thing I want to say about the propaganda from the rebels. I saw accounts, I saw Twitter accounts that were, that were clearly, blatantly propaganda from the rebels. <laughs> clearly. I mean, so bad, so obvious that it was, it would be laughable if it wasn't such a crisis moment, right? So clearly there's propaganda. But, but what, what bothers me about this thing is that People have moved into people have moved into the the realm of dismissing anything that doesn't fit their narrative as propaganda. That's the thing. Like, like I've seen really smart people who I respect and I follow and I read their articles, they're journalists, I read, I've seen them fall into this trope of anything that came out negative against Assad was clearly just propaganda. And let me ask you a question. Do you think Assad went into Aleppo handing out cookies and milk? I mean, clearly, when people said that they were dying, do you think Assad was just going in there saying, hey, guys, the fight's over now. Let's, um, let's all kiss and make up. Or do you think he was going through fucking shit up, shooting people, bombing people, doing everything he could to get back control of the city? So unless you think Assad went through there and just was like, oh, yes, hey, guys, we're totally sorry about the misunderstanding. 
unless you think he went through and did that, he clearly went through with brute force and crushed the rebellion, which from the lens of people who are on the other side is an atrocity. So how can we, who are critical thinkers, dismiss every single report from the, from the opposing side, from the rebellion, and dismiss it as, prop, as American-backed, anti-Assad propaganda? Reality doesn't work like that. And by doing that, what we did was we completely erased the people who were killed. And I will say massacred because you don't want to say massacred because, oh, he was just trying to reclaim his city. If in the process of reclaiming your city, you are gunning down civilians or you inadvertently kill civilians, it is still a massacre. And this this incessant need to rewrite Assad through the lens of anti-American imperialism has pushed some progressives into a corner where the only way they can rationalize it is by sympathizing with Assad. When there is a third option, Assad is a son of a bitch and the rebels were a bunch of sons of bitches. And in the middle were people who some supported Assad, some wanted to defect and wanted Assad overthrown. Some people who were pro-rebellion, some people who were pro-government forces. We cannot over simplify. Every situation is as complicated. Think about how, how complicated and drama-filled your individual day and life is and you want to oversimplify hundreds of thousands of peoples, uh, hundreds of thousands of motives, and then these individual groups who were the belligerents who were fighting, you want to reduce them down to being just, oh, they're only propaganda from uh, America. I'm sorry. I just, I just the, the, the oversimplification of this situation has been my... Uh, the bane of my existence, uh, which is clearly a first world problem, which is clearly a position of privilege when my <laughs> my exasperation with Syria is about how we analyze it versus what's happening there where people are getting killed. 